Chapter 12. Questions and Answers. Discovering E.T. Identity. Question. How can I really be sure and know if I'm from another planet? Can I ever be 100% sure? Answer. Yes, you can be 100% sure, but only after developing a deep intuitive awareness, which would probably require some kind of meditation and consistent self-reflection. You need to acknowledge any fear, pride, and doubt you have in your mind, and then be willing to accept the truth of your identity, whatever it might be. There is no glory in being an E.T. soul, and no shame in not. It is only the truth that really matters, plus the trust in yourself that's needed to uncover it. If you feel a sincere, burning need to know, then follow all the clues and listen to all your thoughts and feelings. Then relax. Over time, the answer will come by itself. The Mission of Wanderers Question I've always felt that I had a special mission on Earth, yet I've never been able to define it. Can you tell me how to figure this out? Answer As I have mentioned before, all wanderers had a definite reason for coming, but not all of us have some grand mission to perform on the world stage. The basic reason we're here is to give a boost of love and light to assist the planet itself in its own transformation, which is no less than a cosmic initiation. Just being here, awake in human form, is a kind of radiatory service, and it fully supports the planetary process of growth. In terms of a particular form of service, it all depends on your inclinations and desires. Some people can heal, some write or teach, while others make wonderful parents or even limousine drivers, as I used to be a limo driver myself, I know it's true. In fact, our company had another driver who also confided to me that he too believed himself to be an E.T. soul. So you can do whatever you like, but I don't think many wanderers come here to change the course of history with inventions, peace treaties, technologies, or medical breakthroughs, although it does happen sometimes. The most profound service can really be done by offering kindness, compassion, and a bit of clear thinking to all those we meet. Each of us has our own sphere of influence, such as family, friends, community, and workplace, in which we can be available to help, and the most important place to make a difference is always right in front of us. Wandering, number one. Question. Is information available about the system by which extraterrestrials come to Earth? For example, how is this decision made? Who is selected? By whom? On what criteria? And for how long? Are there other possible destinations for them? Or is Earth their one alternative? Answer. As you might expect of wanderers whose origin and identity has been veiled by agreement, most ET souls cannot explain exactly how they came to Earth. Since there's little channeled information on these specific matters, we can only turn to subjective sources, intuition, and inner guidance to get something close to real answers on the background procedures of cosmic wandering. In my understanding, there's no obligation upon anyone to, quote, leave home, but rather it's a voluntary agreement between higher-density souls, their entire society, and those who oversee interdimensional soul transfers onto particular worlds. Individual souls must sincerely desire the opportunity to serve in this way, and through their unified consciousness in the home society, it must be agreed upon by the entire group, since it affects them all. Indeed, many wanderers sense that what they do on Earth is intimately known and felt by their home density group. Of course, Earth is not the only site of incarnation. Any planet with souls calling for aid, consciously or otherwise, is eligible to get such assistance. Call and you shall receive. Since this type of intervention affects other solar systems, the influx of souls must also be okayed by those who oversee the evolution of life on the destination world. In the raw books, it is said that the Council of Saturn, a group of fully enlightened beings comparable to cosmic Buddhas living in the rings of Saturn, has ultimate responsibility for this particular solar system. Therefore, they are also involved in the planning and oversight of wanderer groups coming here. The exact details of specific arrangements, including the length of stay, number of incarnations, birth locale, and human family, are complex decisions which have to take into account many different factors. However, the primary factor that drives the entire process 
is the destination planet's need for service, more esoterically, its need for love-light energies. Other factors include the planetary being's own point of evolution and its cycles of growth, as well as the spiritual path of learning particular to each ET soul coming into that system. In accordance with cosmic law, a planetary call for assistance can only be honored with respect to the basic preservation of free will. To protect souls on Earth who are not interested in developing higher vision, the wanderers come in veiled, without free use of their home density powers. For those humans who have yet to choose their own path of development, service to self or service to others, the paths of unity and separation, as well as souls who have already chosen self-service, there is also allowed some degree of incoming negative ET groups, which includes a few negative wanderers as well, who are here solely to increase their power through domination. The evolutionary concerns of all parties involved, humanity and the plant, animal, mineral kingdoms, planet Earth and the solar system, wanderers and their own home races, must all be balanced according to needs, limitations, and the best opportunities for growth. While it may seem unfortunate to us, there are limits upon the number of incoming positive wanderers, and limits upon the influx of love light from elsewhere. Clearly, these are complex and subtle matters, but with continued meditation, you'll find more answers available. Universal Wandering number 2. Question. How is the decision made by certain ET souls to incarnate on Earth while presumably others remain on their home planet, never leaving their higher dimension. Answer. The decision-making process is not the same on all worlds, and also depends on the soul's level of awareness. Spiritually speaking, the main group of wanderers come from sixth density, and had full awareness of universal fusion. Before incarnating, they clearly knew their oneness with all that is, including Earth. Their transfer here was simply a matter of which souls wanted to serve the universe in this way. Since there are risks involved, such as completely forgetting the ways of love, then getting karmically involved in prevailing human dysfunction, the decision to enter the 3D Earth system for a particular length of time is only made after due consideration. Those souls who are ready, willing, and able, and whose further evolution would best be served by the challenge of the vivid 3D illusion are those who end up here. The raw material notes that wanderers come in with a mixture of bravery and foolhardiness, having thrown caution to the wind, like the major arcana tarot card number one, the fool. This may be why some ET souls feel like some kind of mistake has been made. In their rush to come to earth in selfless service, they may not have prepared adequately for the trials they are now facing down here on the ground. The Record of ET Service Question. If most wanderers on Earth don't know their purpose and are caught in human confusion, isn't their service here pretty useless? Sending ET souls to Earth seems like a great failure to me. Answer. It is true, most wanderers cannot remember their purpose here. Ra said that only about 10% have pierced the veil to recall their cosmic roots. And it is also true, most of them are trapped in limited, ego-bound Earth conditioning which generates alienation, self-pity, and in extreme cases, personality disorders. You could certainly say that this world salvage project has not been a smashing success. The degree of love light offered, at least in 3D terms, is far less than had been hoped. But to call it a great failure seems a little excessive. From another angle, any degree of true love light offered is important, and without a doubt many souls on earth have been helped. Nevertheless, the thrust of your question is right. I'm sure that when our 3D cycle ends, a lot of time will be spent in higher dimensional ET councils discussing how and why their service rendered, their service rendered fell short of expectations. Yet it is no great mystery. There are many factors working against wanderers' awakening as well as their effective offering. Here is the real short list. The relatively successful work of negative ET groups, primarily Orion, has controlled the thinking of generations, and before that had significant sway on the 3D planets from which most Earth souls derived, i.e. Mars, Maldek, and so on. With this long legacy, 
they have successfully embedded their elitist notions in politics, religion, business, and legal systems. In marriage, love has become identified with possession. In personal life, self-will is shackled to selfishness. As the social matrix containing all wanderers, it usually takes several lifetimes just to recognize some of the many distortions on earth that are simply considered normal here. As a result of all such confusion, greed and materialism have run rampant for quite a long time among these souls. It is grounded in a narrow scientific worldview, fertilized by rugged individualism held in high self-esteem, and watered by the spiritual apathy and disempowerment seeded by dogmatic religion. Add to this the basic ignorance of love and group harmony that is just normal for 3D races, not yet in the density of love, 4D positive, and you have a potentially devastating experience for naive ET souls. Many wanderers stay somewhat disoriented for centuries, and you can often see this among lovey-dovey New Agers. The main reason wanderers are confused is simply built into the contract, agreeing to human genetics and the normal 3D veiled mind. In accordance with the law of free will, wanderers, quote, become completely the creature of their density in mind and body, end quote, from Ra, agreeing to forget their origin, identity, and purpose. Once done, ET souls are pretty much on their own, karmically speaking, and so self-generated distortions from one lifetime are carried over to the next, and the next, unless they are healed through love and balance. According to Cosmic Plan, there is no other way higher dimensional souls can come en masse to this world, and owing to their desire to serve, they agree to all such restrictions and drink the potion of forgetting. Unfortunately, Given the nature of human consciousness and society, their spiritual sleep has generally continued. Perhaps I could estimate the overall effectiveness of wanderers on Earth throughout the entire 3D cycle of 75,000 years at about 30%. This means that 70% of their potential love light has been baffled by mental dysfunction of one sort or another. Is this a great failure? Maybe yes, maybe no. As always, it depends on your perspective. To higher self and the elder ETs living in the light of unity, all is complete and whole and perfect, here, there, and everywhere. To the one infinite creator, whatever proceeds from operation and usage of the law of free will is rich, vivid catalyst and grist for the mill of continued divine play. No complaints here. But for a weary wanderer, it is understandable, and I do see your point. I think you're ready to go home. On taking human form. Question. Why do ETs need to incarnate in human bodies? Why can't they simply stay in the UFOs and do whatever they need to do up there? Answer. There is no cosmic law that tells ET souls they have to take human form. The decision is their own choice based on their personal commitment to service and the deeper needs of the situation, the calling of humanity and Earth itself, which is felt quite clearly in the higher realms outside the solar system. However, the possibility of rendering useful service is tremendously enhanced by taking birth among us, whether or not the wanderers recall their roots. Some wanderers come here to perform a particular task, such as those publicly known as inventors, statesmen, and scientists, while others are simply here to radiate embodied love and light. If and when they pierce the veil of forgetting and acknowledge their greater identity and purpose, their service becomes even more effective. Such awakening involves spiritual realignment, reconnection, and return to inner self, which allows us to realize and appreciate divine love and cosmic design once again. Metaphysically, this opens a channel to the spirit which can benefit many people, as well as amplify the effectiveness of whatever service we choose to offer. To offer oneself in physical form is a much greater self-sacrifice for E.T. souls, and can be far more effective in a one-to-one -one way than had they stayed up in their UFOs. More on the Wanderer's Veil. Question. What is the veil of forgetting under which star people live while on Earth? Answer. This veil is simply a temporary severance in our physical 3D space-time experience of the ET soul's normal link-up to his or her own higher self-awareness, which was previously intact before coming to Earth. 
the veiling is cosmically ordained, required by laws of the solar system itself, and exists for as long as the ET chooses to incarnate on the planet. Essentially, it is in place to protect humanity's choice, which is their option to accept or reject the reality of cosmic law and the existence of a multi-dimensional universe. None of the benevolent ETs, be they incarnated wanderers or those in UFOs, wish to force themselves upon humanity. Through deep self-reflection and meditation, you can remember your forgotten identity and life purpose, but to entirely regain all the home realm powers and abilities, one must dedicate one's life to selfless service, meditation, sacrifice, and radical detachment from all elements of personality. This would be no different than the spiritual path of many Eastern religions and all mystery schools, beginning with the Egyptians and South Americans, whose teachers also happen to be ETs. Psychological Explanations Question. Most psychologists would say that your so-called ET souls are simply adults who were abused or emotionally wounded as children and have now chosen this strange sense of identity to feel special. What do you think about this? Answer. I think this type of explanation is probably true for some people. And in fact, several of those I interviewed in my first book did come from dysfunctional families with some degree of trauma in childhood. However, most of them did not, and many were quite mature psychologically, what would be called high-functioning, which means they function quite well in normal human society. Moreover, many of them did not feel special at all, and sometimes considering themselves ETs made their lives more difficult. The whole question of ET identity really concerns the validity of subjective knowing, based ultimately on intuition and what spiritual traditions the world over call expanded awareness. The modern field of psychology represents just one way of viewing the self, and concerns only one mode of human experience, conditioned patterns of thought, feeling, sensation, and behavior. These psychological explanations, no matter how reasonable they sound or useful in some cases, do not eliminate the possibility of the metaphysical or transcendental. Considering claims of ET identity, we must acknowledge an entirely different aspect of human experience and self-nature at stake. Benevolent ETs and human free will. Question. If Watkins and Wanderers are really from ET civilizations much older and presumably wiser than Earth's, then why don't they just step forward as our leaders and solve our problems? Answer. As I have said many times, benevolent ETs won't save us from ourselves. They are only here as midwives to humanity's birth as self-conscious souls. Through sharing love, wisdom, and an appreciation of oneness, they can only support choices we make according to our own free will. Furthermore, since most people do not really take UFO matters seriously and choose to remain indifferent to seeking direct ET assistance, those who watch over humanity cannot intervene directly, even if the alternative is some measure of planetary destruction as was the case in Atlantis, which is said to have perished under its own aggression about 10,000 years ago. However, if and when a significant percentage of the population sincerely calls for aid, there can be direct contact and intervention, but this depends entirely on the conscious calling of humanity. Wanderers and Negative ETs Question. If some ETs on Earth come from planets which are kind and loving, I assume that other ETs come from worlds that are warlike. Why don't you write so much about them? Answer. Indeed, some ETs do come from hostile and conquering worlds, and when they incarnate on Earth, they can be called negative wanderers. Negative only in the sense that they reject universal love. There are far fewer of them here than benevolent star people, but they can be found in the highest ranks of worldly power, autocratic, controlling, intensely self-serving, and quite effective, enjoying the fruits of power, as Ra would say. The reason I do not dwell much upon their ways, in contrast to other channels and researchers who speak endlessly upon the evil doings of greys, reptoids, draconians, and so on, is generally because most people are not concerned with this sometimes troubling, always serious discussion. Additionally, my work is to amplify the light, not battle its absence. In my understanding, the best way to serve is to radiate light, not to oppose darkness. It is quite important, however, to appreciate, understand, and not shy away from really coming to terms with the workings of negativity, 
in the development of wisdom. It is essential for those of us who embrace unity. But not to fear, there is ample darkness around for your study. Negative ET influence on channels. Question. The raw material says that channels who seek positive information are high-priority targets for the Orion Group and negative ET interference. How can we know if a particular channel has been compromised and their information distorted? Answer. Generally, individual channelers are first offered various ego lures in an attempt to lead them away from the pure desire to serve others. Simply put, these telepathic suggestions from Orion ET sources amplify whatever latent desire for money, power, fame, and pride that the channels already have. The classic example is the Guru Dominator, a role you can see in action with some popular channels in the U.S. and Japan whose spiritual organization controls the money and personal lives of his or her followers. This represents an energy reorientation to more self-serving ways of conduct. For other channels, more subtle temptations can also be offered by negative ET groups. The glamour of receiving detailed information on ET plans and hierarchy, plots and cover-ups, and near-term predictions of frightful catastrophe or happy-face ET mass landings. In this camp, you will find channels whose books and lectures drown us in fear-based warnings or baffle us in cosmic facts, figures, names, dates, and places. This kind of information sounds spiritual, but it's merely trivial. Not surprisingly, when Ra was asked about the percentage of channels in the world today who are compromised by negative ET interference, they declined to answer directly, since they considered a direct answer to infringe upon the free will or confusion of some living. Instead, Ra offered the following advice to help us develop our own discernment. Quote, We can only ask you to consider the relative effect of philosophy and your so-called specific information. It is not the specificity of the information which attracts negative influences, it is the importance placed upon it. So judge for yourself. If the channeled material preserves the thread of eternal philosophy, then it is likely to be pure. In this case, it will support greater self-understanding, self-appreciation, a balanced way of life, and the full-bodied development of love, wisdom, and will. Such qualities of true self are the foundations of all traditions of ageless wisdom, East and West, and are at the heart of the teachings given by Ra and the other elder extraterrestrials. In contrast to negatively influenced channeled works that offer sensational, glamorous trivia, all pure teachings begin and end with the essential. As Ra once noted, true spiritual work shall always begin and end in the Creator. ET Abductions number one. Question. If aliens are from older and wiser worlds, why do they abduct and terrify people? Answer. This question brings us into the issue of cosmic good and evil, the genuine polarities of ET life. As I hope you know by now, there definitely are aliens who seek domination, control, and conquest. Meanwhile, there are other groups who forever have our best interests at heart. Whether we like it or not, some planets and their entire civilizations have developed themselves along the, quote, evil line, and the Creator gives total freedom to this choice. These groups, although spurning love, still exist within the greater infinite love and are progressing along their path, developing body-mind-spirit, all the while denying, however, real love and unity. Of course, the aims of these groups have nothing to do with the work of most E.T. walk-ins and wanderers who only want to help. E.T. Abductions number two. Question. Is it possible to stop having abduction experiences, and how can I end these ET contacts? Answer. In my experience, there seem to be few abduction experts and therapists who offer ways to terminate unwanted contacts. Many of those who specialize in the field actually seem to consider such contact, which, as true violation, is definitely worthy of the term abduction, to be some sort of planetary wake-up call, some kind of wonderful opportunity for humanity, so that they have no interest in trying to end them. Sometimes you'll even find so-called experts arguing with experiencers who feel traumatized, trying to convince them that they created their own terror through misunderstanding. In my opinion, some of these experts are just whitewashing the unpleasant aspects entirely. The most obvious example 
being the now fashionable use of the term experiencer instead of abductee. To me, this is just a form of twisted, politically correct double talk, trying to alter perceptions of reality by changing the labels, which the specialists justify by saying that the new label helps minimize a person's overwhelming fear and sense of victimization. However, the fear, trauma, and sense of helpless victimization are just what the aliens intended. To minimize them is ultimately to rob the abductee of the very catalyst for their empowerment, the motivation to terminate contact. According to Ra, if these qualities of fear, terror, and violation are present, the contact was most likely of a negative nature, offered not to help humanity, but to increase the power base of self-serving ET groups. In the long run, their goal is no less than planetary conquest. If the contact generated terror and helplessness, doom and disorientation, then we are talking about abduction. Let us not mince words, please. And I can assure you, I'm not falling into some kind of cosmic racism, as I was once accused of doing by a very positive channel who should know better. Some psychologists in the abduction field are just normal clinicians documenting an unusual population attending to the needs of their clients, hoping to increase public awareness. Others are simply curious about alien technology, i.e. implants, and seem to be playing detectives hot on the trail of a clever villain. Unfortunately, almost none of these workers have sufficient metaphysical background, and so they cannot really offer much in the way of healing and protection. Only a few leaders, quote, in the field, seem to understand the deeper principles involved here, the universal laws of consciousness, polarity, and multidimensional energy. If you have had or continue to have abductions and want to end them, you must do work in consciousness, developing greater and more centered awareness, beginning with absolute self-acceptance of all the emotions involved, to ultimately dissolve the mind of helplessness that actually attracts self-serving aliens. The qualities of will, discernment, and compassion especially for yourself, must all be increased. Developing true will leads to real empowerment. You cannot do this to me. Clear discernment leads to clear knowing, such as, I no longer need this experience. And compassion generates forgiveness, such as, I accept myself for having allowed such abuse into my life, but I do not need it any longer. It helps to find a healer or a counselor with a grounded spiritual perspective and embark upon formal meditation practice. Using traditional Buddhist or Hindu mantras can also be effective in terminating negative ET contact. I recommend you read Appendix 2 on Counseling Abductees and Contactees. Remember, as an expression of universal spirit, the core of your being is boundless power. Within you right now is all the power you need to overcome negative ETs. The only question is your willfulness to access it. ET abductions number three. Question. A friend of mine has been having what seemed to be abductions, waking up in the morning with memories of flying and marks on her body. How can I help? Answer. When we talk about abductions, we are certainly venturing far from the self-discovery process of walk-ins and wanderers. Although some abductees are in fact ET souls, they have been violated, traumatized, and hurt by their experience, which is exactly why we can use the term abduction. When I counsel people with these experiences, the first question I usually ask is simple. Do you want these contacts to continue or not? For many, such alien relations fill an emotional void, longing for a protector, a comforter, a powerful source of greater life meaning. Such psychological dynamics often reveal the common link between childhood abuse and later life abduction. Damaged self-esteem opens a door for negative alien intrusion. In many cases, the person is operating from a deeply heartbroken need, and they're confusing power for love. They often have an inner void of love, which is not too unusual in this world, and have not developed enough self-love to fill it, so they attract alien power without love. As within, so without. Our external relations always mirror our inner self-process. So, before terminating negative contact, a person must look to their own needs and clearly recognize which course of action provides a path of empowerment and self-respect. After that, there must grow a conscious dedication to greater spiritual alignment. 
This involves some sort of serious decision to sever subconscious links with the abducting ETs, intensifying their personal call for contact and fusion with higher self, guides, and protectors, and then learning how to honor and freely express their inner will for positive control. I will not allow this type of experience in my life. Admittedly, it is usually difficult to terminate negative abduction contact, but it can be done. I know several people who have. In some ways, it is no different from the mystic path of overcoming inner demons or obstructions of mind. It takes will, more will, balance, and self-kindness. Furthermore, dedication, commitment, and firm resolve are essential. You must truly believe in yourself and raise your awareness to a level higher than that of those aliens. Wanderer's Choice Number 1. Question. Do all wanderers come here willingly? Have you come across anyone who felt like being here was an accident, or they were forced here against their will? I've never felt like I wanted to be here. Answer. I have met many people who feel like they did not want to come to Earth, but thought that for some reason unknown to them they ended up here. Most of these people felt severe alienation and homesickness, and some even had suicidal thoughts. If we apply a psychological interpretation, we could trace their sense of, quote, accidental birth to some kind of intense emotional pain experienced earlier in this life or in past lives. However, bear in mind that just because they had this kind of psychological process does not mean they cannot also be an ET soul, as mentioned in an earlier reply, which was psychological explanations. For the most part, however, I imagine many of the people who have a sense that their birth was some kind of mistake are probably wanderers. Conceivably, there could be accidents in interdimensional soul transfer. Perhaps it is possible. Yet it is hard to imagine positive wanderers being forced to come to Earth against their will, as they almost always come from groups already unified in love, or that higher self might make some kind of mistake since we can assume it knows what is needed for its own evolution. In my opinion, the idea that one had some kind of accidental human birth usually comes from a mix of personal emotional conflict, past life karmic burdens, and pre-birth wounding that is sensed but not healed. Finally, more than a few wanderers have programmed for themselves, before birth, tests and life challenges that they now feel are too much to handle. In this case, the only thing that can be called a mistake was their pre-birth assessment of their ability in physical 3D to deal with the chosen hard times. Nevertheless, I do admit the possibility that in rare instances, some wanderers have ended up on Earth by mistake. Being reasonable, we can assume many scenarios are possible. Wanderer's choice number two. What if an ET decides he or she has had enough and wants to go home? Don't I have the right to leave when I want to, before completing some kind of contract? Answer. Normally, ET souls' pre-birth agreements are not broken in the middle of the cycle, midway through a series of chosen incarnations. This sense of follow-through is just the same as with higher self, which normally won't pull the plug, withdrawing life force, to leave the body in the middle of a lifetime of pain, sorrow, and missed opportunities. Perhaps the most important means of our evolution is the right to fully experience the consequences of our choices. The aim of incarnation is not to have a good time, nor cut it short if you can't, but rather to learn the lessons of love, wisdom, balance, and faith, the ultimate antidotes to despair and hopelessness. No conscious soul denies itself opportunities for learning, nor would higher self which is why it does not just evacuate all the E.T. souls having a hard time down here. In my opinion, if a wanderer feels he or she has had enough and wants to go home early, it's probably because that person is missing opportunities for personal growth here on Earth, and of course has a lot of inner pain. There are certainly situations in which a premature exit from the body entails no karmic debt, but they happen only in rare instances to expedite soul evolution not to relieve one's discomfort, which is, in any case, simply the consequence of the person's own spiritual imbalance. Remember the old saying, you create your own reality. If you are having a hard time, it's pretty much your own doing. I do not mean to be judgmental, but we are totally responsible for the quality of our consciousness, and most of our conditions, such as what we call our life, 
are the direct result of our own previous choices. As Ra would say, there are no accidents in evolution, although there are mistakes. Rather than hoping for rescue, it would be far more effective in the long run to discover the means of rescuing ourselves. Wanderer's choice number three. You said that some ETs end up in mental institutions. Why don't their home planet people just come and take them back? How could they be so cruel as to just leave them there? Answer. Another question from a wanderer looking to take an early flight. Again, the path of soul evolution is not traveled via protection from pain and sorrow. Instead, evolution is the opportunity to develop all aspects of the divine equipment accessed through body, mind, and spirit under the guidance of higher self. According to the law of free will, all souls have the right to make their own choices, but for the full development of consciousness, it's absolutely necessary to experience the results of our choices. No soul finds itself in a mental institution by accident. No one ends up with a miserable life by accident. In all such cases, a major portion of responsibility for the creation of those conditions has to be taken by the soul involved, having made certain choices towards those ends, either before, during, or after birth in the present lifetime. This is the operation of karma and cause and effect, which is one of the basic foundations of soul evolution, ET or otherwise. If you think your home planet people are being cruel by not rushing to the rescue, then you may also consider this a universe of endless cruelty, an idea which is, unsurprisingly, shared by more than a few wanderers and others who feel helpless, since there is such tremendous suffering all around us. Nevertheless, the principle of what is called karma suggests that there are definite causes to all tangible effects, and that we constantly create our reality, both individual and collective, inner and outer, through our continuing thoughts and deeds. According to this view, it is imperative to experience events fully, since they are a perfect mirror of our soul's activity and point of evolution. As cosmic beings still on the path, wanderers are no exception to the rule, and like everyone else, we have to learn our fair share of responsibility through life experience, both happy and sad. Wanderer's Reincarnation Question. I really feel like this is my last lifetime on Earth. Is this possible? Answer. More than possible. It's actually quite likely. Many of the wanderers now remembering their cosmic roots have been here for many lifetimes and are finally at the end of their contract. Most of them made previous agreements to remain here for a particular length of time, so it is normal that their veil of forgetting, forgetting both identity and purpose, is finally wearing thin. But not to worry, homecoming awaits you. There will be many other benevolent ETs coming here to take your place in Earth's new civilization, so the planet will still have a lot of help available. Sharing your ET ideas. Question. In your book, you detail the problems walk-ins and wanderers have with loved ones. I want to tell my parents about my experiences, but I'm worried they'll misunderstand. What should I do? Answer. Sharing your thoughts about your higher dimensional origins is not easy, and it should only come after a long process of becoming familiar with the issue yourself. If you do not know your own thinking, how can you explain it to others? But after you have come to peace with what you believe is real, then it is important to share your conclusions with those who are close. However, you may never know how much they really care until you open up. And therein lies the problem. How do you disclose such radical notions to those whose reactions you can't predict? There is, of course, no standard way to break your secret. However, if you stay calm, sensitive to both their potential confusion and your own feelings, you can keep your balance. Just remember, go slow, do not force anything, realize that some of your loved ones simply can't handle these ideas, and be willing to find other people who can, and they will likely become the nucleus of your next support group. You need to realize that some losses cannot be helped, and you're not responsible for other people's reactions. Above all, Try to trust your inner resources, and don't be afraid to go your own way when you have to. It's all for learning. Wanderers' Dreams and Out-of-Body Experience Number 1 Question When I was young, I used to have dreams of flying in spaceships with people who seemed to be like my family. What do you make of this? Answer I cannot say exactly what happened in your dreams, 
but I interviewed many wanderers who had this type of experience. What you are recalling in these dreams may actually represent a type of bleed-through memory of having been with your ET group, either before coming to Earth or in out-of-body states as a child while so-called asleep. As children, we are usually more open to remembering multidimensional experience, as we are carrying far less mental baggage. That you still remember these dreams is also important. Their content may point to particular aspects of your total self which now demand attention, developing certain skills or resolving certain issues. The meaning of these dreams is available within your own mind. The answers are waiting for you. Wanderers' Dreams and Out-of-Body Experience 2 I have had several dreams with a group of white-robed beings that seem to be doing some kind of ceremony. Have you ever heard of this before? Answer. Although your question does not give me too much information to work from, and there are many explanations for this kind of dream, I can share some idea of what this experience is all about. In most cases, such a dream is not really a dream at all. It is a memory fragment of a genuine out-of-body experience in another dimension, such as the astral plane, or for wanderers, a higher density, that may have little to do with planet Earth. While some people have reported this kind of experience taking place in their own home, such as a group of beings circling around their bed in a non-threatening way, most of the time this type of ceremonial contact occurs in a dimension beyond the physical 3D world. It is a kind of formal group meditation ritual which can have many aims. You have to remember that once outside the body, most of us have far greater awareness of our cosmic relations. I used to call this my night job, as opposed to my day job in physical 3D form. Not only is it true that we are spiritual beings experiencing life as a human being, but moreover, most of us have ongoing formal service obligations as part of the non-physical groups that may or may not have that much to do with Earth evolution. As in the writings of 20th century theosophy, there really are masters or accomplished beings at or beyond the level of higher self, invisible ashrams or spiritual teaching centers, and esoteric energy rituals performed to assist interplanetary evolution. Sometimes, the images we recall from this kind of dream represent a composite memory of many different elements, both subjective, imaginative, and objectively metaphysical. In the case of wanderers, robed beings with an air of great solemnity are often one's own family, which means that the person who has this type of experience is an integral member of the group. This is not quite the same as the typical ET contact, which creates a feeling of being visited by strange aliens, benevolent or otherwise. For many star people, a ceremonial type contact is the trigger for awakening to ET identity or to greater remembrance of ongoing activity in other realms. Many times, the ceremony that is being performed relates to world service, assisting planetary evolution by invoking amplifying and transmitting cosmic energies, what the Hindus call prana, or universal power, this is no different from what the so-called hierarchy of masters and initiates do to help the earth. The only difference is that while they are fully conscious of what's happening, while we, who consider it a dream, actually splinter our recall upon returning to the physical body. If you look deeper at the images in this kind of dream, you might discover exactly what relationship you have to these beings and just what role you're playing in the ceremony. ET near-death experiences Question. What happens when ET souls have a near-death experience? Do they see people from their home planet, or do they only meet people from Earth who have previously died? Answer. Since I have not personally had an NDE, a near-death experience, I cannot really say what is standard for wanderers who do have one, or if there's any standard experience at all. But basically, according to theory, who you meet during an NDE really depends on who is available, since some souls who could help you have already taken rebirth, as well as which souls can best redirect you back into body, back to your 3D form. Like all souls on Earth, wanderers may have many different beings helping them from inner planes, the non-physical dimensions that interface physical 3D, including past life karmic friends, teachers and angelic forces, as well as ET family. 
I'm sure some souls from back home can redirect wayward wanderers who need to get back into their body from an NDE. Bear in mind, however, they may appear in non-ET forms, which would certainly be necessary for most Starborn, since most of us have totally forgotten the way we were. Wanderers Home Planets, number one. Question. I feel like everything I learn on Earth is somehow transmitted to my home planet, so they experience everything I'm going through. Have you heard about this before? Answer. When we talk about the purpose of ET souls coming to Earth, a more subtle goal that is often ignored is the development of the home planet group. Since most wanderers come from worlds or realms with complete social and interpersonal fusion, whatever is experienced by one is known to all. And while you cannot see them with your physical eyes, I assume that each wanderer's home planet group knows full well that he or she is here and remain connected at a deeper level. So they struggle as you do and learn as you learn. One of the people I interviewed for my first book felt that she came from Sirius and had chosen before birth the tremendous negativity and social conflicts that she experienced throughout her life here. She believed that dealing with these struggles was part of the education of her Syrian group, who needed direct experience of human conditions to better serve humanity in the future. It is interesting to realize that despite the spiritual maturity of those home planet or non-incarnated benevolent extraterrestrials, they can be quite naive when it comes to earthly matters. Therefore, wanderers in 3D form also form a bridge from their home realm onto the Earth and back from Earth towards their greater cosmic family. Wanderer's Home Planets number 2 Question. If a wanderer has been here since Atlantis, doesn't that mean that by the time they get back to the home planet, the people they once knew have all changed? How awful to go home and find out that everyone's gone. Answer. To deal with this kind of interdimensional measurement, you have to understand that time on Earth is not the same as time in higher or more light-filled densities. For example, 25,000 years here may be equivalent in both subjective experience and linear time to 25 days there, in the same way as out-of-body travelers often relate that their epic journeys took place in a mere few minutes of Earth time. Check the works of Robert Monroe, for example. Most likely, of more concern in this kind of situation is the fact that since wanderers do wander, when you return to the home group, some of your friends may have already left to serve on other 3D worlds. Of course, you can always sign up for another tour of duty and go join them. Wanderers Home Planets number 3. Implants. Question. How do our fellow ETs in space know who and where we are? Do all wanderers have some kind of implant? Do they keep track of us all? Answer. Contrary to some New Age channels and healers, I am sure most wanderers do not have tracking implants. Furthermore, wanderers rarely have abduction implant experiences. Passing along the notion that everyone is implanted is a fine way to grind us into a sense of helplessness, weakness, and passivity, which is why I believe negative ETs are promoting this particular concept. Contrary to opinion, human souls on Earth are not fully controlled by evil ET rulers. There are forces of darkness, anti-soul, anti-love, both above and below, but the degree of their control depends solely on the degree of our being out of touch with higher self. Their power depends totally on our own disempowerment. How much control they have over us depends on how much power we give up. Since most wanderers come from ET groups that are fully telepathic and mind-linked, what Ra calls a social memory complex, it is not hard for the total system to keep track of each member of the whole. This condition is similar to what develops from meditation practices that synchronize mind and body. Consciousness comes to pervade our entire form, and we grow aware of the life energy in every portion, ultimately every cell of the physical body. Likewise, our home family, especially in the elder races, is also aware of its wholeness and lives in a quite expanded state of group unity. Additionally, many of us are in regular contact with home group souls through ongoing out-of-body travel, which is, however, generally forgotten upon our return to the body upon awakening in the morning. Most wanderers are still in the loop and linked up to the home group, so tracking devices are not needed. Some ET races may make non-physical implants, i.e. astral body beacons, but since it is not my specialty, I am no authority here. 
Artists as ET souls. Question. Do you think some artists are ETs? A lot of those I meet are pretty far out. Answer. Some of my best friends are ET artists. Actually, since art can become a palace of inspiration, imagination, and harmony, it can be a very attractive home for wanderers on Earth. Just look at the Seth material, channeled by the late Jane Roberts. Seth, himself an E.T. soul, was a true cosmic artist. Art and the creative process can be a very healthy and spiritually uplifting way to escape the shackles of materialistic society. It can certainly be a path of increasing awareness, service, and self-integration. As a channel to divine beauty, living in the world of art can also refine love. On taking an E.T. name, I've met a lot of people who've changed their names and now say they're from such and such a planet. I think they're quite flaky, don't you? Answer. Personally, I do not feel the need to change my name. It just doesn't seem necessary. But for some people, it represents the new self they're trying to integrate, and so it serves a purpose to them. Many people also feel affinity for certain planets and stars and take special names to vibrationally anchor greater contact. As in all these matters, the individual motivation can range from the sublime to the ridiculous, from heartfelt sincerity to shallow grandiosity. If you take a deeper look at the person who has taken the new name, you can see where they're coming from. It's best to reserve judgment until you see the big picture. Bear in mind, however, that many ET races do not even have a concept for the practice of naming oneself. Our naming is a very human habit. Wanderers and anger. Question. I have a real hard time dealing with anger and I just want to run away and hide when people start to fight around me. I wish I could handle this. Do you have any suggestions? Answer. For E.T. souls, strife and conflict were basically absent from the home world group. Most higher dimensional worlds are unified and harmonized, with all members cooperating for the common good, with no more petty anger and selfishness. Coming to Earth, a world of duality, confusion, and distorted egotism, Wanderers are generally unfamiliar with the forms of negativity and often try to avoid them. Some E.T. souls even withdraw from society or turn misanthropic. If you want to cultivate wisdom and will, which are qualities of the higher chakras and densities beyond the heart, which represents fourth chakra or fourth density associated with love and compassion, then try to be with it. If you can learn how to feel and accept the energies of conflict, you can then use the light of mind to realize their origins and so develop greater wisdom. If you can bless and try to see into the anger storming around you, you can also develop a greater sense of center, quiet empowerment, and standing firm. Of course, it can be most difficult. Nevertheless, fearlessness can grow alongside the wisdom of seeing clearly, and the will can be cultivated by standing still amidst the storm, which certainly doesn't stop you from taking direct action if need be. If we can achieve balance, then discernment can tell us if there's some way to serve the combatants, which in many cases simply means keeping cool and offering words of reconciliation. You may also need to right a wrong and take corrective action. If you can develop the needed qualities to deal with anger, then your human training has been most successful, and you will be the toast of the town with your home planet elders, even though they haven't seen strife in aeons. Wanderers and Health Question. I am a wanderer who is pretty well adjusted to Earth life, but it seems I am always getting sick. Is this related to being a star person? Answer. I have met a lot of wanderers who live with chronic ailments and illnesses that just do not go away. In fact, allergies are one of the most common traits of ET souls on Earth. When a person feels severe alienation over a long period of time, the physical body gains a kind of disorientation that impairs its normal adjustment. Just like the body of Earth, which stores and retains the energy of disharmony created by humanity over the millennia, then coughs them up in geologic upheaval, so too does our own physical body store and retain the energies associated with our troubles. When a person feels depression, despair, and estrangement for many years, this compounds their energy center blockages and their body shifts to accommodate these perceptions. As Ron noted, the body is a creature of the mind. When the mind has dis-ease, so too will the body. Living in silent sorrow, as many wanderers do, the result for some is chronic ill health. 
It is also common for ET souls to choose a distorted, unhealthy body so that the limitations of physical infirmity can be a catalyst to greater spiritual seeking and sensitivity to human sorrow. There are also some wanderers who have not been here before, they are in their first lifetime in the solar system, perhaps, and knowing that this is their one and only chance to experience Earth's 3D cycle, they program a sickly body to fully taste the limitations of 3D. Of course, from a soul perspective, having a weak body is no punishment or restriction, but rather a set of distortions that might provide an opportunity to accelerate growth if met with sufficient wisdom and self-love. For spirit, the greater the limitation, the greater the potential learning. Finally, I've also met wanderers who seem to have taken upon themselves some type of group or family karma. By voluntary agreement, they have chosen to take birth into a human family in which everyone is dealing with some kind of serious hardship, in terms of health, relationships, finance, or self-esteem. In these cases, it is likely that they chose this family to be of service, hoping to ease the burdens of those around them by sacrificial self-constraint. The beautiful little girl whose body is twisted and deformed by childhood polio may well be a high-density soul intending to bring light into the family through her example of courage, offering her body to generate catalyst for her parents in the hopes that they will open to greater love by their desire to care for her. Ironically, they feel sorry for her, poor little girl, and pity her, while at the soul level she had compassion for them and therefore chose infirmity. Actually, this is quite common. So for wanderers, what is normally an expression of karmic limitation, born of necessity for soul evolution, can also be chosen as a form of service. Wanderers' Difficulties Question. What do you think is the single most difficult issue for wanderers on Earth? Everyone I know who feels like they're from elsewhere seems to be having a pretty hard time right now. Answer. In my opinion, there are two major challenges that trip up most wanderers although you'll find countless permutations on these themes. The first challenge is posed by the nature of third density itself, i.e., this particular level of existence, the material physical world. And the second is the nature of this particular civilization, our particular Western society. It's nearly impossible to make a smooth adjustment to life on Earth given these two factors, although these conditions are exactly why we're here in the first place. Wanderers often take many lifetimes to resolve the conflicts and confusion they have acquired around these issues, and are most likely still in the process of healing their multiple wounds. Ironically, most ET souls are totally unaware of the interdimensional psychodynamics that lie at the root of their difficulties, as they imagine themselves just like everyone else. Regarding the issues of third dimension, we should remember that it is part of the cosmic plan at this level of being that awareness is veiled. Therefore, it is entirely natural that souls in 3D forget love and their essential oneness with God and each other. This is but the required operation of the law of free will in a density of spiritual choice. It would be a mistake to curse this apparent limitation of 3D. We had better get used to it, and get used to the fact that the only way to pierce the veil is through transpersonal consciousness, through meditation and inner work. After this, the second assault comes from human society itself, notorious throughout the galaxy for its aggression, ignorance, and self-denial, boasting an incendiary mix of pride and arrogance, much lacking in compassion and self-awareness. Coming from elsewhere, wanderers also tend to get confused over humanity's denial of spiritual reality, thinking that, quote, everyone should already know that, End quote. But here on Earth, they don't. Nevertheless, we need not become self-critical, as even Ra confided that they, quote, cannot plumb the depths of the distortions which infect your peoples. End quote. It may take wanderers many lifetimes to understand human society, a society which doesn't even understand itself. Whatever the affliction may be, it sure doesn't feel like home. Wanderers' difficulties number two. Question. A friend of mine is quite detached from society, and while he realizes he's a wanderer here to serve, he still avoids close contact with people. Why is this? Answer. After awakening to ET identity, some people lose all desire to be a part of this world. Actually, some kind of collapsed motivation is common, and really comes from a desire to return to more harmonious dimensions. 
while we have complete free will to do as we like, and no ET elders are standing around forcing us to engage in society, this kind of withdrawal is like licking our wounds in the corner. Of course, many wanderers feel tremendous wounding and society suffers from great disharmony. Plus, the more sensitive you get, the harder it can be to live in the middle of strife. Yet, this disharmony is just why we are here, and if we avoid it, aren't we also avoiding the very purpose of our life? For some people, social detachment does open the door to productive creativity or intensive self-work. But if it hardens into bitter disdain or reluctance to give a hand where a hand is needed, then it stems from emotional blockage and does need healing. Forgiving yourself and those around you is a good first step. And after that, simply ask yourself what you really need. Your degree of social engagement is, of course, totally up to you. E.T. Children Question. I think there are many special children among us today, but whenever I've suggested to teenagers that they might be starborn, they don't seem too interested. Why is this? Answer. Without a doubt, there is almost zero peer support among today's youth for being an extraterrestrial soul. It is rare enough for American teenagers, or teens anywhere, to have a mature spiritual perspective, and there are countless social influences distracting them from self-reflection. They may think the TV series Star Trek or Babylon 5 is cool or that X-Files could be real, but their interest usually stops right there. It's one thing to be entertained by unsolved mysteries and a strange universe, but quite another to consider the real source of our interest. For teens and adults alike, the question, why am I interested in these things, is rarely asked. Nevertheless, as that generation grows up, their basic openness and the emerging public reality of cosmic community will help them achieve greater spiritual vision, if they seek. And remember, for those children who are wanderers, this is generally their first lifetime on Earth, so they're just getting their feet wet. For more discussion, see the chapter in Section 1 entitled The Children of Today. Healing Lost Idealism Question. When I was young, I was very idealistic and had great hopes for my life. But as I got older, I became somewhat bitter. Do you think this is common for wanderers, and what can I do about it? Answer. Personally, I have felt quite a lot of bitterness myself, and many wanderers who are serious about helping the world and who understand the status quo or power elite, which maintains injustice, deception, and deceit, have also become quite cynical. Sometimes they are downright hostile towards the world and even humanity as a whole. At the extreme end, it can become toxic and lead to sociopathic tendencies. Every once in a while, I encounter rage and human hatred in my sharing with wanderers. I imagine that once upon a time, all these angry souls were sweet children, sincere helpers, idealistic servers, yet today they have become totally spun around. This type of reversal, well understood by the English poet William Blake, who sang of three phases of life, innocence, experience, and higher innocence, is a process of getting weighed down with world weariness. The soul begins fresh, pure, simple, appreciating life and naturally being kind. Then over the centuries, through multiple lives, the soul encounters harsh society, competitive and striving, still operating under tribal law, dog-eat-dog, dog, look out for number one, nice guys finish last, etc., etc., Incoming wanderers, or any young soul for that matter, may react quite strongly to the general lack of love and compassion, the sharp sense of separation, and the mass denials taken for granted here. It is easy to become bitter, and easy to lose hope. Starting from a mind of great innocence, human dysfunctional patterns are internalized, and are then interpreted as a sign of a damaged self, or felt as loss and insufficiency, or proof of our being unloved, unworthy, abandoned. Herein lie the seeds of future life karmic liabilities. To make matters worse, these feelings are rarely identified by the conscious mind, and they usually remain unexpressed for fear of making things even worse with our human peers. The soul, beginning its cycle of human incarnations, thus becomes wounded, crippled, and doesn't even know it. Future lifetime programming would then be needed for healing and rebalancing the core sense of self. How can we overcome the mantle of 3D Earth human sorrow? 
Well, there is general advice applicable to all, and there's guidance specific to wanderers. Considering what's applicable to all, we must understand that spiritual evolution is self-generated. We must pull ourselves out of despair. For all of us, native or resident alien, the ultimate healer is always self, which is the basic source of self-acceptance, forgiveness, understanding, and strength. Often, bitterness is the fruit of old pain compounded by isolation and healing can come through opening up to trusted friends and loved ones. When we learn to embrace all aspects of our experience with unconditional acceptance, then we can better handle the slings and arrows of life on earth. While the healing process begins and continues from within, it is greatly supported by friends and partners. As it proceeds, greater self-alignment and self-sufficiency grow, along with a greater ability to make peace with the world, which really means making peace with our own pain. Yes, it can be done. I know my own experience, and I know the experience of many other wanderers. Additionally, there is also solace in seeing the big picture, considering our previous history before coming to Earth, our future course after leaving. Our life is far greater than all we know each day, and not only do we have cosmic family waiting in the wings, but we are also thoroughly loved, known, and accepted by countless souls in spirit. It is not necessary to live out our days here in misery, pining away and waiting for salvation. It's far better to make the most of this life, which is an opportunity for accelerated growth. We need to face our pain. Wanderers and all who are seekers should never forget the tremendous power we have within us to improve the quality of our lives wherever we happen to be.